All right, joining us now here on In the Circle in D1 Softball. She's in Lafayette, Louisiana, finished off calling that dramatic Lafayette Regional alongside Clyde Madvick. Of course, I speak of the two-time Olympian, a gold medalist, four-time All-American at UCLA. One of the greats of all time, Natasha Watley, joining us here back on In the Circle D1 Softball. How you doing? Oh, good. Tired. My goodness. I feel like I just played like <laughs> seven games, but at least you didn't have to stay up till 3 a.m. Eastern, like uh, oh. some in Tallahassee oh, where I was at. Goodness. Yeah. Um, Carol Bruggerman and, and Mark Neely, they, those are the true heroes as well, as long as, as along with um, the athletes, too. So, well, let me start with that before we get into your regional, which was fascinating. You were you're a player who played all over the world. What's the latest you've ever played until? Because for those that don't, UCF and Auburn played an elimination game, started around 10.32 p.m. Eastern, went over four hours, ended around 3 a.m. Eastern with Auburn winning in 12 innings in a game where Sarah Willis uh, and Maddie Penta were phenomenal. Both went over 200 pitches in the game. Penta with 21 strikeouts. Uh, it kind of was the last game that finished in the region. Have you ever played in a game that late and long like that? Yeah, I, I can't even think about yesterday, but I would remember if we played, I don't think I've ever played that late. Probably the latest, maybe like maybe midnight, but not 3 a.m. Like that is nuts. Like that's just crazy, crazy to me. But I mean, hats off to everybody who, even the fans who stuck around and just uh, both those teams, hats off for just competing. No doubt. In the wee yeah. hours in the <laughs> in weed hours in the morning, yeah, uh, it's pretty wild. You had a unique regional yourself with Baylor winning there the, the Lafayette Regional in a Game 7, beating Louisiana after Louisiana had run-ruled Baylor 13 to nothing to force the if-necessary game. And I guess the question I have for you is, how was Baylor able to bounce back after Louisiana really just ripped into them. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm following you and Clay and, you know, the way Louisiana came out and played to force the game. So you're thinking they're just going to continue this momentum because they've seen all the Baylor pitchers and yet right. Baylor found the way. How did they do it? Oh my gosh. I mean, I am trying to figure that out, but I mean, honestly, like just a short term memory, like they just were able to flip a switch and it was like, okay, like new team new chance, new opportunity. It was almost like you felt the game that they were, you know, for lack of better terms, getting smashed, that they had already conceded and were already looking towards the next game because Coach Moore taking out, ben, or putting back, I'm um, sorry, he took out Crandall. Uh, he took her, I like my brain. Yeah, that was all, it's all mixed up. But he ended up taking out um, Benford, having her sit. She was playing third and then ended up putting her back in just to kind of close out the game, just to, you know, like, let's hurry this thing up. But um, it was almost as if they already had conceded and started to look forward to the next game. What was the difference maker for Baylor to get over the hump here and win this region over a talented Louisiana team that last year made it to the Supers, coming from, ironically, from behind like they were trying to do today, where they won a game six in Baton Rouge and forced that game seven where they played that wild game seven to beat LSU to get to the Supers. How was Baylor in front of that great atmosphere in Lafayette? What was the difference for them? Difference were the hitters that surrounded Govan. So, you know, Govan has been their biggest hitter throughout the season, throughout Big 12. I mean, she's even had so much success at that stadium. Uh, earlier in the season, Baylor and Louisiana had faced off and she was like lights out then. But the difference were the hitters around her. Uh, I mean, Emily Hot led off with a home run to start the game, the last championship game. Aaliyah Benford behind go on um Anna Watson Colossus Colossus had a home run today as well too so I just I think it was the hitters around her and I think that that was the difference um they had just been looking to her for all their run support and all of the other hitters I mean they stepped up they were they were something else today you got a chance to get to know Baylor very well you did the big 12 tournament last weekend uh with Pete Sousa you got to know Baylor you got to talk to coach more what jumped out at you about Baylor because I know you you were impressed with them seeing them in Oklahoma City, and you wondered how they would come out in Lafayette. What stood out to you in kind of being around them? I like I feel like a broken record, but Benford, <laughs> like Brentford, Randall, um, but Brentford and the 
Big 12 tournament stood out the most to me. Uh, I mean, just her composure, uh, her presence on the mound, her command, her changeup, her, her changeup is like, you know, legit. Um, so that stood out to me too. I, I think their solid defense pylon at short. Um, I hadn't heard of her prior to, you know, coming into covering these games. And I mean, she has gained a fan. So um, I think that just, their pitching and the defense, honestly, are the things that really stood out to me. Well, their offense, I think in the winner's bracket game, I believe scored seven runs in that second inning to break that open and really kind of take the air out of the balloon there in Louisiana because that could be a rabid atmosphere. Did you sense a, a sense of surprise by the Cajun fans when Baylor jumped on them? Because I thought that set the tone for them in that winner's bracket game. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people were shocked. I mean, you could even see it for the Cajun fans, the Cajuns themselves. Um, you just didn't expect them to come out like that. You th you know that they have a couple of hitters, it's sprinkling some hits throughout their lineup, you know, like I mentioned Govan before. But when you compare the two offenses, like you definitely look at Louisiana and you think that they are an offensive team. And I look at Baylor and I think they're a defensive team. And so um for them to pull like, together their bats I mean I think that that was the difference for them to pull ahead and I think that that game that you're talking about sent a message for sure if you're Jerry Glasgow in Louisiana what's going to keep you up at night thinking about this regional when you look back here in the next in the coming days and weeks for them I mean you know an opportunity to host they hadn't hosted in years you know what, what do you think is going to keep them up at late uh, up at night I think uh not leveraging that hosting and, you know, playing in your own ballpark, staying at home and not leveraging that a little bit more. Uh, I think that Baylor game, like just, it kind of deflated them. I think they were taken aback. Yeah. They bounced back. They, you know, they came back against Princeton playing a good game against them, but, um, and they came back even today, but I, I, I think, um, just kind of stepping on the gas and continuing to step on it. They they were kind of on their heels a little bit that first game yesterday, and I think that that kind of was the difference for them. They struggled with Princeton. Princeton pushed them in extra innings. That's been a theme in the regionals, the mid-major stepping up and pushing the big teams there. What, did, what was your thoughts on Princeton? I think they represented themselves very well. They eliminated Ole Miss in the regional, got a win, and then pushed the Cajuns to the brink in, in extra innings. What were your thoughts on Princeton? Because I thought they made a great impression. Yeah, I fell in love with Princeton. I mean, I got to have dinner with them on Thursday night. They invited me to dinner. It was super cute. And I just like, I wanted to go just because I remember being an athlete and just, and the fact that they invited me too. So um, I was just really impressed by their energy. They were, yes, excited to be there, but they also wanted to make a statement as well. So I do think that that first game that they had against Louisiana on Friday I do, I do feel like it got a little big for them, that the moment got big and that they were just kind of happy to be there a little bit. But then as they went into Saturday, it was like, okay, actually, like we're here, like we're going to make the best of this experience. And um, they just definitely are a team that plays, like they want you to remember them. Like, yeah, hey, maybe we don't get the outcome, but we're going to play you tight. We're going to play you tough. We're going to play with a lot of energy. We're going to play with a lot of passion. And uh, they're just, they're fun to watch. Looking now ahead for Baylor, they're going to play Florida in the Super Regionals. The Gators breeze through their regional. So Baylor on the road will be an underdog there. What do you think they got to do to get to a World Series? And what's so fascinating about Baylor, I think if we were having this conversation about Baylor back in February at around Mary Nutter time, we would not have been surprised because this team was a top 10 team at that point, had an incredible Mary Nutter. And we're thinking this is a contender. They had a lot of adversity, some injuries, had a middle of the season. They slumped. They turned it around late in the year. Now they're on the road, two wins away from a World Series trip, maybe improbable for Glenmore. What do they have to do, you think, to pull that maybe so-called upset against number four seeded Florida? I think their offense just has to continue to stay hot. Um, and like I mentioned before, the hitters surrounding Govon have to continue to stay hot. Um, and she's got to continue to stay hot, too. Um, what I really liked from them is their small ball when that game that they run ruled Louisiana on Saturday – they're putting down bunts, moving runners, and just playing a little bit of small ball. I think they're going to have to continue to play that game um, of just continuing to get traffic on the bases. Um, I, I think I like the matchup 
for defensively, I, I really like them defensively. Their defense is solid. Strain made a million plays in center field. Great catch um, versus Ole Miss. Made a great play today versus Louisiana. So, like, the defense, I, I feel pretty confident for them for their defense and their pitching, and I think that they like the matchup um, with their pitching staff and, and defense heading into Florida. Baylor, one of four teams in the Big 12 advancing to the Super Regionals. Uh, all four obviously getting a regional final. I would argue all five Big 12 teams technically played on a regional Sunday because UCF, even though they were eliminated, played all the way to three in the morning on Sunday. I think that counts as a regional Sunday, but that's just me. Uh, all kidding aside, but you were impressed. I know you and I, when we met in Oklahoma City, you were impressed. You got to call the Big 12 tournament, the entirety of it. And you were blown away by how good the league was. Certainly, everybody knows about Oklahoma and Texas, but you were impressed with Oak State in talking to them and Baylor. What's your impression here? You're not surprised that we got four Big 12 teams here advancing to the Supers with three of them hosting as favorites to potentially get to the World Series. I mean, personally, having covered the Big 12 tournament, um, I'm not surprised at all. You know, like having had that experience, like there's no question in my mind the teams that advanced um, from Big 12 definitely are high contenders of uh, uh, they, they deserve to be there and I'm not surprised at all and um I mean just ba you know just to talk about Baylor I, I just I really like them as a team um I think just the adversity of talk about the injuries and you know back in February definitely they're a top 10 team and they had that because they went through a lot of injuries but I think that adversity has made them stronger and you see them like just really gelling and playing together. And I don't know. I, I like what I see from them. Let's talk a little bit about you. Uh, you're now doing broadcasting for a few years. Now. I believe this is what your third regional you've called. My third regional, but I, um, I will share that I actually called a region 2004, right when I graduated and was so intimidated <laughs> and fun fact that maybe like not anybody knows and I've never shared it but I um got an opportunity and I actually called Kat Osterman's game so Kat was still playing I went down to Austin called that game and like was shell-shocked like people talking in your ear um trying to watch the game trying to figure out all this I mean it was just too much for me so I would say solid has been um these last three or four years that I've come back and that's not your, so <laughs> that's your that's your former teammate there there uh it's gonna be she listens to this she's not gonna be real pleased gonna make it sound like it's old there you guys but uh what have you learned the most from broadcasting here you work with clay maverick now i believe the last couple of years you had that wild los angeles regional that we talked about forever last year certainly ucla got some revenge this year in that regional but you got to call that la regional you got to call lafayette what have you learned here in the couple of few years here broadcasting? Because I know you've done games for ESPN, you've done games for Pac-12 Network, so you've kind of gotten to a rhythm here. And you, I know, you, and talking, you you enjoy doing this. Oh my God, it's so much fun. I mean, just I mean, I think doing it on this side of my life, um, there's so much joy of just you know, one, yes, being a part of the game still and still being able to connect. But I think the part that I enjoy the most is just being able to talk the game and share experiences and you, you know we as an athlete we've been there before we've been in these moments and so um that's the thing that I've learned the most is just to kind of overshare um although sometimes I feel like it may be obvious um it's just to continue to share what I would do in this moment you know as an athlete like you know what should we be thinking in a 3-2 count bases loaded things of that nature so um, it's just been a joy. It's definitely been a challenge. I mean, I think the preparation part and just learning teams and, you know, I may not have necessarily seen a team, um, but I think just remembering once the game starts, the game doesn't change. And so just being able to talk the game, but at least have a little history of um, both of the teams that you're calling for. I'm curious, you've played in the biggest stage in the sport. You've played for the gold medal. You've played for a national championship. You've played for the in the highest level in pro softball. How does that, you know, you know, you know, kind of a goosebumps? I don't know if you had goosebumps before a game, things like that. How do you compare that before moments before going into a broadcast? It's actually kind of similar. Um, I noticed that I'm nervous for both. 
And so I know <laughs> as an athlete, when I was nervous, that meant that I was present, I was ready and just trying to channel that nervous energy into positive energy. And it's in the same thing, you know, a, a broadcast it's live and, you know, it's just go time. And like, there's something about that showtime thing that like, I just really like get a thrill out of. <laughs> and just when it's, you know, three, two, one, it's like, okay, like, let's go. All, you know, all the information that you study for, if you don't know it now, then you just don't know it. And you just got to get, you know, you got to get through it. But I think, you know, I just, I like that the journey. Um, yeah, it's, it's very similar to being an athlete, to be honest. I always wondered about that. Yeah. Comparing the two, because part of it, right. I've always talked to athletes who get into broadcasting. Part of it is they want to stay around the game. And if you can't play the game, you know, the other options to stay around the game is either coach or broadcasting. And it seems to me that you prefer the broadcasting side. You never, I don't know if you ever had interest in coaching or not, but is that one of the reasons why you got into broadcasting to stay around the game? Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah. And I coached a little bit. I coached, I was a volunteer coach at UCLA for a little bit um, at CSUN, but uh, I think just, you know, now I have a family uh, and just the dedication to coaching, I mean, is just a whole nother level. Um, and I feel like I did that as an athlete. And so, you know, broadcasting still is a, is, is a big time commitment, but it's more seasonal. Um, and I don't know. It's just, it's, it's a little bit of a different feel um, in terms of um, I guess, commitment, because once the game is over, you kind of, you can throw away some papers. If you're not covering the team. And then there's a, there's a disconnect and then there's still a way to be dis uh, connected when you're preparing for them and you're covering it and you're doing the call. So I guess I like that part. Well, I know this, if you work with Clay Madrick again, next time, you got to introduce me to him. Cause he's actually one of my favorite broadcasters. I've always said he's one of the most underrated guys could do literally every sport uh what have you learned from him because he's a vet i don't think it's an accident they paired you up always with a vet broadcaster like him i'm sure he's kind of giving you some pointers and you've learned some things what's it been like working with clay um i feel like i i was thinking about him over the last three days like i'm like he is a machine um he's like a literal machine <laughs> and so um the best feedback that he gave me last year was you know your stuff and who's going to question you and just tell what you know, because what you are saying is not wrong. He's like, just say it and say it with conviction. And so that's probably been, been the biggest advice. Um, I love how he prepares. Um, he just, you know, that when we're doing the coaching calls, just the questions he asked, the way he asked them, it's uh, he just has a way of connecting with the coaches and he has a way of connecting even with me as a broadcast um, partner, I feel like he brings out a lot of me. So he's just like this magician of being able to pull out a lot from me, but then he's like just this machine of just controlling the game and he knows when to stop and pause. And he, he's just, he's incredible. And um, I've learned a ton. <laughs> I've learned a ton from him just, uh, you know, the last couple of years being paired up with him. Yeah, he's I would good. say he is under I agree. Definitely underrated. Get Clay, Clay Madrick, underrated fan club right here, uh, if he hears this. Uh, yeah. I want to ask you about your former teammate, Caitlin Lowe, because I think I told you this. I covered you the pro with you when you played back in the days with UCLA A and the NPF. You and Caitlin Lowe were back-to-back, -back, top of the order of that incredible lineup, which was always an interesting argument uh, in the press box. Like, who should lead off? Like, here's two of the best that could easily lead off. In like 99.9% of teams, and here you are both on the same team. I bring her up because she just got Arizona into another uh, super regional, winning in Fayetteville, beating Villanova. Ironically, they will play Oklahoma State in the still in the super regionals. That's going to be a next year, a year from now. That's going to be a Big 12 series, as strange as that sounds. But your thoughts on Kate, uh, having now been a head coach, been to the World Series, of Arizona, taking over for Mike Kendra, who you played for in the U.S. national team. Just your thoughts on Caitlin Lowe and, and, and as somebody that's played with her uh, and has now seen her in the coaching ranks. I like how much time do we have? Um, Caitlin, I mean, she is the most intense teammate I've ever had. And talk about someone who makes you better because um, you're right. Like either one of us could have been in the, the leadoff spot, but uh, she pushed me to be better because I know if I get on, like she's just going to make more things happen. Um, 
But as a coach, I'm just so proud of her. Um, I mean, she had some really big shoes to fill. Um, Coach Candrea, we all love him. And she has just done it in her own way, um, had to make some big decisions. And she is just being able to lead in her own way. And she's an intense person. And just being able to translate that into her coaching um, style, I think, I think those kids love playing for her because she is intense and she does demand excellence and she does have high expectations and she does it without not necessarily actually saying it. It's just her presence and um, how she carries herself. I can talk all day about her. I I just, I think she's just an incredible, um, impactful person in our sport, not only as a player, but as a coach as well. Uh, It'll be interesting to see how they fare against Oklahoma state in the supers. You called games in the Pac-12. You played in the Pac-12. I think it was what Pac-8 or Pac-10, I should say. When you back when you play there, Pac-10, Pac-10. Yep. Has it hit you that this is it for the Pac-12, or is that not going to hit you until maybe the start of next season? I think it's going to hit me next year. Um, obviously, yeah. We've we've all been talking about it for all of us that cover the Pac-12. I don't think it's going to really hit hit me until uh, we start seeing this sh- actual shuffle happen. <laughs> um, of all our uh, of all the teams dispersed wherever they are all going <laughs> which is everywhere everywhere is the word with ucla going to the big 10 which will be something weird to get used to there uh for your alma mater they, they used to say that weird it's it's all weird it's it's weird it's and it's sad i mean i you know the pac-12 is what i grew up watching what i grew up dreaming to play for growing up I either wanted to go to UCLA or Arizona and so that was on my radar and so to like know that Pac-12, Pac-10, Pac-8 is no longer heartbreaking it, it breaks my heart. It's unique we'll see college athletics will be different it'll be unique to get used to we'll see how it kind of compared there now we had you on a few years back and I remember we talked a lot about the your, your foundation just tell the audience uh, what have you been up to when you're not broadcasting softball and, and, and what, what you've been up to these days and, and working on? Ah, a lot. Um, just even while I was here uh, calling some games, we still were doing some programming back in L.A. And um, yeah, I started the foundation in 2009 and just wanting to bring softball to every single girl. Um, I was seeing that um, a lot of girls weren't getting exposed to the sport. Um, and so that was just huge for me is just like how can we get this game in front of everybody and so um partnered with the city of LA um doing stuff with Dodgers Foundation as well where we just really kind of bring the color to the game in the sense of um training um coaches so a lot of college girls who are home for the summer we ask them to be our coach mentors and so there's a league that runs through the city of LA and so we do um league play camps, clinics, but our coaches, we kind of like lend out our coaches to um, the city of LA and also the Dodgers Foundation as well and just teach the game, try to get girls exposed. Yeah, maybe they're not going to be the next Olympian or All-American, but they're going to learn a lot of things and the tangibles that come with playing the game. And so um, it's been a lot of fun. Like this weekend, we while I was here, some of my girls were putting on a pitching clinic. Um, some of my other coaches were at a coaches clinic with Players Alliance, which Players Alliance is an MLB program, or sorry, not program, an MLB um, ex players organization. And uh, yeah, like we're just, we're doing a lot. It's a lot of fun. It's another way to stay in the game, stay connected, and, and most importantly, give back. Where's the biggest growth you've seen since you've uh, started the foundation? Oh. Um, I mean, besides just the number of girls we're serving, um, I mean, I just, I think the collaboration within the softball world has been the biggest thing. Um, just everybody that we work with or that we partner with, like, it's just, it's been so genuine and pure and organic of just trying to grow our sport and make our game better. And so the collaborations are probably the things that have grown the most in the last two to three years of just how can we work together and just finding a way to work with any and everybody in our softball world. Where can people find out more information if they want to kind of get involved? 
Uh, go to uh, natashawatleyfoundation.org. That's the place to go. My last question, you mentioned Los Angeles. Can't let you go without asking you. The Olympics will be back 2028, Los Angeles, your backyard, coming out of retirement? No, I'm just playing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We're announcing your, it today. <laughs> breaking news. Breaking news. If Kat could do it, why can't you do it? You know, Kat did it in the last Olympics. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not. <laughs> not doing it. <laughs> but what, what's your reaction to the Olympics being back and the impact of that, not just for the global game, because you play globally, but also in Los Angeles? Huge. It's huge. Um, I'm kind of proud that it's going to be in L.A. and that um, I definitely will figure out a way to be there, be a part, or, you know, just now I have a two-year-old daughter. Um, she won't be two at the time, but I mean, just the possibility of her even just seeing that makes me really excited. So, um, yeah, I, I don't have any affiliation or I don't know what will end up coming together at the time, but I'm always open to um, figuring out a way if there's opportunities that arise to be around because it's going to be really big for the city of LA to host that. If nothing else, you're going to be there. I have a feeling watching the games. I mean, that's what I mean. At minimal, I will be in those stands. Cool. I know who to hit up for tickets then and just bother yeah. you. And then you'll be like, <laughs> ah, I'm sorry. I don't got, you know, hanging out yeah. there. Uh, we'll see him go. But listen, it was a pleasure to get to talk to you in the last week or two. We'll stay in touch. Uh, but I want to get you on to kind of catch up. People were kind of cool to see you on the air with Clay once again, doing the regional. It was a dramatic going seven games with Baylor winning. Uh, but we really am glad that you're still around the sport. I think you're, it, it's awesome. You're doing the broadcasting. Hopefully, uh, we'll cross paths in the broadcasting in the booth in the, at some point down the road, but, uh, thanks for, uh, coming on the show here and, and you're during your time there in Lafayette, Louisiana. Great job. And, uh, we'll be in touch and definitely get you back on, uh, later on down the road in the future. I appreciate it. And thank you for what you're doing for our game as well. So you've been, a, you've been a big part. So thank you.